Hello, in today's online module, uh, we'll be discussing on newborn or neonatal resuscitation protocol. So first of all, where does NRP come from? The International Liaison Committee on Resuscitation, that is ILCOR, coordinates a rigorous 5A evidence-based review of topics. And ILCOR reaches an international consensus on the science of resuscitation for newborns, children and adults. Each council or country that participates in ILCOR refines the science into resuscitation guidelines that fit the culture and resources of the region. The American Heart Association and American Academy of Pediatrics wrote the neonatal guidelines for resuscitation and released these in October 2015. So coming to the background, birth of a newborn is a potential medical emergency, mainly because all babies need assessment for resuscitation at birth, the need for resuscitation at birth cannot always be anticipated. And all equipment should be regularly checked to ensure they are available in various sizes and they are functional. Approximately 85% of the neonates born will breathe spontaneously, 10% require stimulation, 3% positive pressure ventilation, 2% intubation and 0.1% chest compression. According to new NRP, there is increased emphasis mainly on teamwork, preparation before resuscitation that is structured check of equipment and supplies and also identifying rules and mainly accurate documentation also. So just before birth, that is preparing for resuscitation, the four pre-birth questions which we are supposed to assess are, first of all, what is the expected gestational age? Is the amniotic fluid clear? How many babies are expected and are there any additional risk factors? Along with that, a team briefing is very important. That means we have to determine the team leader clarify roles and responsibilities and give delegate tasks. Also we have to perform a standardized equipment check. Introduce yourself and discuss the plan of care with the parents if not already done. Ask the pro OB provider the plan for delayed cord clamping. Preparation for birth. What are standard precautions? First of all we have to maintain a strict asepsis. All resuscitation apparatus should be clean and sterile. The suction catheters, mucus extractors and all the equipments should be single use and sterile and disposable. And also we have to take precautions for personal protection. This is the equipments in a nutshell. First of all, to provide warmth, we have to give, we have to have a preheated warmer, warm towels or blankets, temperature sensor and sensor cover for prolonged resuscitation, a hat, a plastic bag or plastic wrap mainly for preterm babies especially less than 32 weeks of gestation and also thermal mattress for preterm babies. To clear airway we require a bulb syringe, a 10 French or 12 French suction catheter attached to wall section set at 80 to 100 millimeters of mercury and even though it is given meconium aspirator here as per new guidelines meconium aspirator is not required for resuscitation. We also require a stethoscope and to ventilate we require a flow meter set to 10 liter per minute, oxygen blender set to 21 percentage or 21 to 30 percentage if less than 35 weeks of gestation, positive pressure ventilation device either in the form of a self inflating bag or a T-piece resuscitator, term and preterm size mask, an 8 French feeding tube and large syringe to decompress the bubble if we require to give positive pressure ventilation for prolonged period. Also, we require equipment to give free flow oxygen, a pulse oximeter with sensor and cover, a target oxygen saturation table. Also, for intubation, we require laryngoscope with appropriate size straight plates, stylet is optional, endotracheal tubes of size 2.53 and 3.5. Now, we don't require a full size ET tube. A CO2 detector, a measuring tape, ET tube insertion depth table, waterproof tape or tube securing device, scissors, laryngeal mask size 1 and 5 ml syringe. And for medication purpose we require epinephrine which is prepared in 1 in 10,000 concentration, normal saline, supplies for placing emergency umbilical venous catheter and administering medications. And also ECG monitor leads and ECG monitor. So just now we have discussed the equipments in detail but there are certain equipments which are desirable especially in the Indian setting. These are a blender, a pulse oximeter with ECG, a CPAP and a manometer. It is desirable it is, if it is there during the birth setting. And there are some instruments which are not considered necessary for resuscitation. 
mainly they are a laryngeal mask airway and the ETCO2 device. Now coming to the rapid evaluation of the newborn. After antenatal counseling and team briefing, just after birth of the baby, we have to ask three questions. Mainly, with the baby's term or preterm, how is the tone, with the baby's breathing or crying. If the answer to all these questions is yes, then we have to give routine care to the baby. So first of all, what is routine care? Routine care means we have to keep the baby with the mother, deliver the baby over to the mother's abdomen. Then provide warmth by skin to skin contact and also by covering the baby with a warm towel. Also maintain the position of airway and clear secretions only if required. And we have to drive the baby along with ongoing evaluation. This is what is called routine care. Another important component of routine care is delayed cord clamping. That is delayed cord clamping after one minute. As of now, umbilical cord milking is not recommended as part of NRP. Delayed cord clamping is recommended for all vigorous babies, but delay is not recommended if there is placental circulation disruption. That is mainly if there is abruption, a bleeding placenta previa, a bleeding vasa previa or cord avulsion. And also there is insufficient evidence in case of delayed cord clamping the baby is not vigorous and also in case of multiple gestation births. So as I mentioned before, routine care means it should be provided over mother's abdomen. Suppose the baby after birth, it is not crying or breathing or if there is hypotonia or if it is a preterm baby, then we have to proceed to what is known as initial steps. So what are the components of initial steps? So in initial steps, first of all, we have to do immediate cord clamping. Then we have to provide warmth by placing the baby under the radiant warmer. We have to position the head and neck to clear the airway and again suction only if it is required. Again, we have to dry the baby using a warm towel. Then stimulate the baby by gently rubbing the back of the baby. Again, the flicking of the soles and vigorous drying or shaking of the baby is not recommended. After all these initial steps, we have to assess the breathing. If the child is breathing, then again assess the heart rate. If the child is not having breathing or is apneic, then again start positive pressure ventilation that is the next component of NRP. So just to mention about meconium stain liquor. So as per new guidelines, irrespective of whether baby is vigorous or non-vigorous, you don't have to do endotracheal suctioning. And again, as I mentioned before, for stimulation, there is no flicking of slows, only rubbing of back gently is recommended. Now, again, after the initial steps, if the baby is not breathing or the heart rate is less than 100, then we have to go for what is known as positive pressure ventilation, which can be given either by a self-inflating bag or a tapis resuscitator. So we have to basically assess the heart rate by auscultation. Palpation of umbilical cord is less reliable and less accurate. And if auscultation is often inaccurate, if baby is not vigorous and we have we cannot assess heart rate with stethoscope, in that case only we have to apply pulse oximeter. If pulse oximeter is unreliable, again apply ECG leads and use cardiac monitor. The most common method what we use is by auscultation. Again oxygen management. We have to start free flow oxygen at 30 percentage, a flow of 10 liter per minute. Initial FiO2 for PPV, if the child is more than 35 weeks of gestational age, we have to start with an FiO2 21 percentage and if it is less than 35 weeks of gestation, we have to give an FiO2 between 21 to 30 percentage. Always use pulse oximetry to guide oxygen concentration and again use 100 percentage oxygen when there is requirement of chest compression. This is the preductal SpO2 target which is given here based on the duration after birth. Again, if the baby is less than 32 weeks, we have to consider CPAP immediately after birth, especially if there is grunting and the baby is having spontaneous respiration. So while giving positive pressure ventilation, it is ideal to position yourself at the baby's head end and we have to keep the baby's head in the sniffing position. Again, a shoulder rule Roll can be used to position the head of the baby. A mask can be of different sizes. It can be a round mask or an anatomic face mask. Again, in this figure, we have 
demonstrate what is the correct size anatomic and correct size round mask. If it is either small or either large, it won't be able to provide adequate positive pressure ventilation. Again, while providing positive pressure ventilation, we have to cup the chin in the mask and bring the mask over the mouth and nose. And we have to maintain a seal with a one hand technique using an anatomic mask or a round mask which is demonstrated in the figure now. Again, if two people are there, we can use a two hand technique with jaw thrust to keep the airway open and then second person can give positive pressure ventilation. The sequence to give positive pressure ventilation is 40 to 60 breaths per minute. That is, we have to give in the following sequence. That is, breathe 2, 3, breathe 2, 3, breathe 2, 3, etc. Count the rhythm out loud to maintain the correct rate. And always we have to target the oxygen saturation and adjust the FiO2 according to the SpO2. Suppose with positive pressure ventilation, initial 5 ventilation or after 15 seconds increase in heart rate or there is no adequate chest rise then we have to follow what is known as MR SOPA that is mask adjustment reposition of airway suction mouth and nose open mouth increase the pressure and finally alternate airway we have to go we have to do at least two things hand in hand. Then again, we have to assess for positive pressure ventilation, whether it is adequate or not. That is, we have to reassess the chest movement. That is how we have to administer MR SOPA. So, after giving positive pressure ventilation, which is adequate, that is, when there is adequate chest rise, we have to give for positive pressure ventilation for 30 seconds. And after 30 seconds, again, we have to assess the heart rate. So, what are different scenarios? the heart rate is more than 100 then again continue positive pressure ventilation until there is spontaneous effort suppose the heart rate is between 60 to 99 then again reassess ventilation and we have to ventilation corrective steps if necessary which i have already mentioned that is mr sopa the heart rate is less than 60 again reassess ventilation give ventilation corrective steps Insert an alternative airway and if there is no improvement, give 100% oxygen and start chest compression. This is the protocol for positive pressure ventilation. Again, as I mentioned, after giving effective positive pressure ventilation for 30 seconds, the heart rate is less than 60. Then we have to go ahead with chest compression. So before chest compression, we have to intubate the baby. So we have for intimation the estimate tip to lip distance it is measured using nasal tragus length or initial ET tube insertion depth according to the table which is given in the NRP textbook. So again as I mentioned there is no need for size 4 ET tube. We have to fix the tube that is nasal uh, tragal length nasal septum to ear tragus plus 1 centimeter. This is the table which again shows the required length at lips depending on the corrected gestational age and weight of the baby. So again, if the weight is less than 1 kg or below 28 weeks of gestation, we have to use 2.5 size ET tube. 1 to 2 kg or 28 to 34 weeks of gestation, we have to use a size 3 ET tube. And if it is greater than 2 kg or greater than 34 weeks, we have to use 3.5 size ET tube. Again, for chest compression, we have to use a two thumb technique. Ideally, place yourself towards the head end of the baby, use 100% oxygen. The sequence should be as I uh, say 1 and 2 and 3 and breathe in, 1 and 2 and 3 and breathe in, 1 and 2 and 3 and breathe in, etc. A cardiac monitor is recommended. We have to give chest compression for at least 60 seconds prior to rechecking the heart rate. Again, the coordinated compression and ventilations are 3 compression plus 1 ventilation every 2 seconds that is 120 cycles per minute. To give the chest compression the ideal position should be the midway between the siphoid process and a line which connects both the nipple. Between these two area we, we can do the chest compression and again while chest compression we have to the depth should be one third the anteroposterior diameter of the chest that much uh, compression we have to give. Now coming to 
medications only two medications you have to remember that is epinephrine that is IV or IO is preferred and if we are not having access while preparing for access we can give one dose of endotracheal adrenaline or epinephrine while achieving intravascular access other medications are normal saline or typo RH negative blood so when do we require medications medications are required when after 60 seconds of effective chest compression heart rate is again less than 60 we have to give adrenaline adrenaline we have to prepare in 1 in 10,000 strength and this we have to load it in a 1 ml syringe and also you have to use a connector or stopcock to transfer the epinephrine and ideally we are supposed to administer the epinephrine through an umbilical venous catheter so this is the epinephrine summary that is 1 in 10,000 IV is a preferred route 1 ml syringe label epinephrine should be prepared and the doses for IV or intraosseous is 0.1 to 0.3 ml per kg we have to administer as rapidly as possible after administration we have to give a flush with 0.5 to 1 ml normal saline we have to repeat adrenaline every 3 to 5 minutes if heart rate remains less than 60 again emergency volume expansion is indicated if the baby is not responding to the steps of resuscitation and has signs of shock or a history of acute blood loss so these are the steps of NRP so after giving the resuscitation we have to give different kind of post station care so if the baby is not having any risk factors then we have to give only routine care as we have mentioned in the previous slides suppose the baby is requiring a positive pressure ventilation for less than one minute then an observational care is required even we can keep the baby with the mother but we have to follow strict vitals monitoring suppose a positive pressure ventilation of more than one minute is required or chest compression is required then we have to give post resuscitation care we have to admit the baby in the ICU Coming to ethics and care at the end of life, if responsible physicians believe that the baby has no chance for survival, initiation of resuscitation is not an ethical treatment option and should not be offered, especially if a birth, a confirmed gestation of less than 22 weeks of gestation, if there is severe congenital malformations and chromosomal anomalies. For birth between 22 and 24 weeks of gestation, we, we can discuss with the parents and also with the obstetrician to decide whether we have to initiate resuscitation or not again after giving chest compression and multiple doses of epinephrine if the heart rate remains zero for 10 minutes or more then we are justified to stop the resuscitation protocol now coming to special circumstances even after following the protocol after giving chest compression and after giving adrenaline if there is no improvement in clinical condition and also there is unequal air entry or there is decreased air entry to one side then we have to suspect pneumothorax in that case we have to insert we have to decompress and we have to insert an IC tube again in case of birth asphyxia especially if child is more than 36 weeks of gestational age then we have to consider therapeutic hypothermia in these circumstances for preterm baby the most important component is thermoregulation that is initially after birth before drying we have to keep the baby inside a polythene bag so that there is very less evaporative loss again if the baby is vigorous we can try delayed cord clamping and again resuscitate or not we have to discuss with the family and also we have to consider the ethical issues in this we have demonstrated the care we have to take for preterm birth that is a thermal mattress may be placed in a blanket in the radiant warmer a polythene plastic bag and wrap for reducing heat loss and another component is early delivery room CPAP especially when there is grunting now coming to resuscitation of babies outside hospital or home delivery special attention should be paid to maintaining normal temperature of the babies who deliver outside hospital settings temperature control measures should include closing the windows in delivery room to prevent draughts using dry warm clothes to receive and wrap the baby and encouraging skin to skin contact in the delivery room resuscitation if required can also be performed keeping baby on mother's abdomen these are the few Indian scenarios which we met frequently 
If post resuscitation assessment necessitates transfer to an appropriate facility, care must be taken to ensure temperature maintenance during transport. In stable babies, skin to skin contact during transport could help maintain infant's temperature during transport. Thank you.